Although she was an enslaved person, Phyllis Wheatley Peters was one of the best known American poets before the 19th century. And by the 19th century, we're referring to the 1800s to 1899, before the 1900s. Wheatley was seized from West Africa, uh, it's believed probably Senegal or Gambia, when she was around seven years old, and this was around 1753. She was transported to Boston on a ship that was carrying enslaved people that were considered to be refugees because they were either really young or old or they had physical frailties. Wheatley was not very strong. She had physical frailties. So when she arrived in Boston, this was around August 1761, the wife of a prominent Boston tailor was looking for a maid for her for the wife. And so the wife's name is Susan, and Susan's husband, John Wheatley, purchased Wheatley, uh, then a slender, frail female for apparently next to nothing because she was sick. She wasn't a strong, considered a strong person, well, she wasn't a strong person. So knowing that she was a frail person, the family still, you know, made her work. She needed to do duties around the house, but they did allow her to learn to read and write. So because of this, she was soon immersed in the Bible, astronomy, geography, history, British literature, and the Greek and Latin classics. So get this, by now she's around 12 years old and she's reading Greek and Latin classics in their original languages, as well as difficult passages from the Bible. She was clearly an exceptional mind because at the age of 14, she wrote her first poem and she wrote this to the University of Cambridge and she expressed a desire for a more rigorous academic environment. Of course, in this time, black people are not even considered human. So the idea that a black person would go to university was absolutely out of the question. And so this wish just wasn't going to come true. But, you know, she's defined this. Clearly, they can see this girl that just arrived and within a few years is mastering not only the English language, but Greek and Latin, the original Greek and Latin, and is writing poetry. And so clearly this idea that black people are incapable of learning and they're just like, you know, just above animals was just um, the lie was being revealed. So an amazing thing happened by the time that she's 20 in 1773, Phyllis Whitley, she had very poor health. Like I mentioned, she's quite frail. And because of her health, she's accompanied to London by, uh, well, they caught the enslavers really, but they of course treating her quite well comparatively. And the, so the son accompanies her to London and it's because actually Susan, the, the woman that bought her, believed that Phyllis would have a better chance of publishing her book of poems there than in colonies. So she's actually writing a lot of poems, people know her talents, but uh, in America she's not going to have a chance of it because, you know, these people are not even human. So um, she's taken to London to, to give her a chance to have the possibility of publishing her book. It must be noted that she actually had access to a lot of people in society that were um, of high standing. So she meets Frederick Bull, who is the Lord Mayor of Land- London and other prominent members of British society when she's there. There's even an audience that's been organized for her to meet King George III. Oh my goodness, this black person that can actually achieve such high intellectual capacity, you know, it just wasn't believed by Europeans that black people were of the same standing as they were. And so she, there's an arrangement, but by that time, the meeting didn't actually take place because by that time, Phyllis has, had left to go back to Boston. Because of this trip, a lady called Selena Hastings, who was the Countess of Huntingdon, became interested in her, this African woman that's that's got such a command of literature, and subsidized the publication of her poems. And so the volume of poems were published in 1773. Interestingly, Hastings, who subsidized the publication of uh, Whitley's, uh, Phyllis Whitley's poems, actually, they never met. She actually died before they met, as in Hastings died before uh, the two could meet. 
While these poems that were published really brought Phyllis uh, Wheatley to fame, she had garnered quite a bit of fame from publishing eulogies. So when people die, she would write, prominent people die, she would write these eulogies. Don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Eulogies to be read at their funerals. Another notable event in Phyllis's life that's worth mentioning is that in 1775 she sent a copy of a poem entitled to his excellency george washington to the then military general so at that time he was not president he was the military general and the following year washington invited Whitley to visit him at his headquarters in cambridge massachusetts and she actually did in march 1776 but you know entrenched ideas can be really hard to shift so a notable experience in phyllis's life was thomas jefferson the the u.s um once president Thomas jefferson upon reading her poem just couldn't believe that a black person could write and this this was his response to her he just basically discredited her and said you know nothing good comes out of black people and he wrote misery is often the parent of the most affecting touches in poetry among the blacks is misery enough god knows but no poetry love is the peculiar ostrom of the poet their love is ardent but it kindles the senses only not the imagination religion indeed has produced a phyllis wheatley but it could not produce a poet the compositions published under her name are below the dignity of criticism so there you have it haters will hate twas mercy brought me from my pagan land taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a god that there's a savior too once i redemption neither sought nor knew some view our sable race with scornful eye their color is a diabolical dye remember christians negroes have black as cane may be refined and join the angelic train the title of this poem is on being brought from africa to america on virtue a poem by phyllis wheatley O oh, thou bright jewel in my aim, I strive to comprehend thee. Thine own words declare wisdom is higher than a fool can reach. I cease to wonder and no more attempt thine height to explore or fathom thy profound. But, O oh my soul, sink not into despair. Virtue is near thee and with gentle hand would now embrace thee hovers over thine head then would the heaven born soul with her converse then seek then court her for her promised bliss auspicious queen thy heavenly pinions spread and lead celestial chastity along Lo, now her sacred retinue descends, arrayed in glory from the orbs above. Attend me, virtue, through my youthful years. Oh, leave me not to the false joys of time, but guide my steps to endless life and bliss. Greatness, oh goodness, say, what shall I call thee? to give me an higher appellation still. Teach me a better strain, a nobler lay, O thou enthroned with cherubs in the realms of day. <laughs>